Um, one of the people that probably is very familiar with, uh, with this, uh, this model as it stood uh, at Waterside is John Hutchinson here. John, of course, is a retired senior captain, uh, Concord captain, and I'd like him to make, say a few words um, about the, uh, uh, the position of the British Airways regarding this model and this event. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great privilege to be here. Funnily enough, I've never seen this model before. <laughs> I used to keep well away from Waterside. <laughs> so it's completely new to me. I'm delighted. I gather it was in a storeroom somewhere and I presume totally forgotten about it and uh, finally somebody found it and here it is on display so it couldn't, couldn't be at a better home. Now as far as this airplane is concerned, as has already been pointed out, this was a test model and I think it's worth just pointing out that flight testing in those days was a pretty, to me, this was one of the last great flight test programs. It was a dangerous um, business and people didn't know what was going to happen if, for instance, there was an engine failure at 60,000 feet, flying at twice the speed of sound. Um, they didn't know what was going to happen. It was, it was dangerous. And this aeroplane, in fact, has an escape hatch just behind the flight deck, where if things had gone horribly wrong, the crew could all open the hatch, drop out of the aeroplane at 60,000 feet, <laughs> and parachute down. Fortunately, that never actually happened. But I just wanted to illustrate the flight testing in that era, we're talking uh, 1969 and the early 70s, was quite a dangerous business. And it grieves me personally that no test pilot has ever been knighted for services to test flying, uh, which I think, when you think of all the people and drug addicts who are knighted because they're pop musicians or something, <laughs> it really hacks me off. <laughs> You might wonder what the significance of the droop nose is for anybody who doesn't know anything about Concorde. Let me just explain. The airplane used to come into land at a pretty high angle of attack, about 11 and a half degrees, and uh, nose up. With that long needle nose in front of you, you would not be able to see the runway as you came into land, which would be a bit of a problem. So. The solution was to have a lowering nose. Um, that solved the problem of being able to see the runway. You had an excellent view of the runway through the conventional windshield. And we used to lower the nose at five degrees down uh, for taxiing, for takeoff, and for flying around in the airport area. And then the nose would go down to 12 and a half degrees down uh, as part of the landing checks. We used to, in training, um, practice flying with the nose stuck up and the obvious solution to doing that was to make it an auto land rather than trying to land it yourself. And as far as I know, this is a great credit to the people who designed the um, mechanism, if you like, for the lowering nose, I don't think there's ever been a case that I'm certainly aware of and maybe Phil Cairns or one of the other engineers here, John Dunleavy, or somebody might be able to contradict me, but I know of no British Airways Concord flight where the nose ended stuck up. Uh, I'm not aware of that at all. And if you needed to lower it in an emergency because it wouldn't lower normally, you simply depressurized the hydraulics and let Mr. Newton's laws of gravity take control and the nose would just sort of go clunk down. Um, so it was a very satisfactory um, um, piece of design in the aeroplane and I personally in 15 years of flying the aeroplane never once had any problem with the lowering of the nose or raising of the nose. Just that finally to give some perspective of what this aeroplane is like to operate people sort of think the takeoff was the exciting bit. Well it was, it was a very dynamic takeoff when those reheats, the afterburners cut in, you'd feel the airplane belting off down the runway like a scalded cat, 
and you knew that that airplane wanted to do one thing and one thing only, and that was to get into the air just as quickly as it possibly could. It was a very dynamic takeoff. Um, but to me, the most mind-boggling bit of it was flying at 50 plus thousand feet at twice the speed of sound. At those sort of heights, you're above all the Earth's weather, you're above the jet streams, you're above the thunderstorms, you're in a very calm, tranquil atmosphere. Maybe you get winds of 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour occasionally. The passengers could sit there with their glass of champagne on the table in front of them and there wouldn't be so much as a ripple on it. It was quite an extraordinary feeling. You had no sensation of speed at all, unless you happened to be flying over subsonic airplanes and we're doing 1,350 miles an hour, they're doing sort of 550 miles an hour, so we're going 800 miles an hour faster than they are, and they look as though they're going backwards as you go past them. You make room just as as you go past. Um, the, the feeling I always used to get flying at those sort of heights, at those sort of speeds, was that you were hanging sort of motionless, suspended in space, and that it was Mother Earth that was doing the moving, and finally the Earth would rotate and there would be New York below you and you'd re-enter and land. And it really was that sort of a feeling. It was completely different to the normal subsonic flying experience. Totally different. Um, and it was magical. And I used to pinch myself in disbelief from my first flight to my very last flight. I, I, the sheer excitement of flying it, the thrill of flying it, the privilege of flying it, was just beyond any words that I can use. And just to conclude, the reason I was, able to, was able to fly that airplane for 15 years was thanks to the likes of Phil Cairns and John Dunleavy and all the other tremendous Concorde engineers who kept that airplane flying. They were a fantastic team of people. And that was one of the wonderful things about Concorde. It was a very cohesive unit of cabin crew, flight crew, ground crew, ground staff, dispatchers, and the ground engineers. And we all had a very close, close relationship and a huge determination to make this airplane the successful project it was in British Airways. So my congratulations to all the engineers who've made this nose functional again and have got the flight deck lighting working again. Congratulations, well done, and I take my hat off to you all. Thank you very much.